And we're back. We have a big hour of National Football uh, League action coming up now. I'm delighted to be joined by former Donegal star Brendan Deveni on the line to look back at Donegal's big win over Kerry at the weekend. Brendan, how are you? Uh, the very best way keeping good. I just got the kids to bed and the the usual panic, and uh, we're 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 there again. Eh? The hard work is done. You can relax now. You can ch- <laughs> ch- chill out, chill out for the night well, now. I, anybody knows me, I'll be saying this man doesn't work hard. But uh, you know what the problem is when you get invested in your kids' playtime because I'm a kid myself. Sometimes <laughs> that can be a problem in the evening there. But anyway, <laughs> when you're after a big feed of curry there and then you're jumping about in the couch, say, well, listen, anyway, it, it's done and they're, they're, they're really bad tired now. I nearly have to scratch it myself after this week. <laughs> never lose that childish innocence, Brendan, I can tell you that. <laughs> never, lo- never lose it. Um, I presume, Brendan, as a you know a brilliant forward back in the day yourself, Paddy, McGri- Paddy McBrearty's clutch point at the end, like I presume the hair is standing on the back of your neck watching something like that. Oh, a massive! Um, I, I can't. I can't remember being as excited about a league game, particularly a first league game, and so so long. I've never seen a build up anything like this. And Patrick will tell you himself, he had a very quiet game. You know, um, he missed a free uh, halfway through that half, which he normally would pop over easily, but he hadn't any real sh- shots and goal. And you can forgive anybody for that. But it's as if you know, come with her and 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 that we give go that you need to do with that packed defence that he just found that bit of room, the bit of experience. And it was something about as he was lining up in that famous left peg of his, you know, and it just about got over the bar. But I, as he hit the ball, I could feel the headlines coming in, you know, for the for the new captain. Mike. But you know, the backstory to this was was unbelievable. I mean, okay, Kerry five all Ireland, Donegal five the last team that started in, in the championship. You know, Donegal give five five debutants, but that has nothing got to do with what's been happening in Donegal, you know, since Declan Bono's departure. There was a big gap then uh, uh, when De- before Declan called time. There was a massive gap then about who was coming in. The rumour mill w- was going crazy. And, and it, it actually got a bit toxic then around, you know, who wants the job. And, and you know, when the guys came in then, there was even more trouble then around numbers of training, guys that weren't necessarily committing. You know, if you look at the... the, the Shane and Niall O'Donnell don't like they're going to be a part of it this year and I know Niall is a bit of an injury I know Pater Morgan's in London he hasn't committed yet you know and there, there's three of course Michael Murphy retires Neil McGee retires you know two two of her best ever you know Michael your captain so you're thinking about you know, when a new manager comes into a team you might have a few hoops to jump through or a few things to get right you know on top of that injuries to some of your best players uh, and and you're just looking at this Donegal team thinking what's going to happen uh, on the day and when they went 163 down you know after about 25 minutes you thought this is a this is a nightmare for 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 Paddy Paddy Carr and, and his crew but from that seven points in a row and um, you know either side of of the half put Donegal in a in a great position and the home crowd got behind him in that and as I say it just fed into this uh, this brilliant thing in, in Bal Buffet the record and um, Kerry listen missed a few opportunities lost her ship. At the start of the second half, in particular, but but they rated that and they had enough good players in the pitch uh, to to think that they could have went on at least got a point out of the game. But I think from from Donegal's perspective, it's a massive two points uh, at home. We, they they have three league games uh, at home this year and four away, so it's it's going to be a difficult league. It finished obviously thirteen points to one nine. Uh, I think Kerry only lost one game last year. I think that was a meaningless league game against Tyrone. So they're already behind the eight ball a small bit, but. Paddy Carr would have been behind the eight ball a small bit too. You know, the pessimism maybe you talk about, the protracted, uh, you know, filling the, the managerial hot seat, Michael Murphy retiring, as you say, players opting out. This is exactly what he needed to kickstart the rain, isn't it, realistically? And particularly in Division 1, which is so cut, so cutthroat, to get off to a good start, to have two points on the board. Look at the counties that don't have two points on the board. So I'd imagine he was a pretty happy man. Now, saying that, you have to uh, you have to move on fairly quickly. They have Tyrone next weekend, they have to travel there, but it's the perfect start for him. Brilliant start for him. And, uh, you know, he's so, like, talking to him after the game, and that he's so softly spoken that I can't see, uh, and he said straight away, listen, if we had lost that by a point, I would have been so proud of lads. And it was a brilliant thing to say. I thought it was a great quote because he realised that that game was on an knife edge. You know, particularly with minutes counting down, uh, say with a five minutes ago, done to over a point up, carried three brilliant chances and he missed them all to equalise. And at that point, the subs had come on and had given more more energy. Done to were hanging on a small bit at that point. They got the equaliser and then I say McBerdy kicked, kicked the winner. But, you know, some of the performances that, that Paddy, you know, you, you to talk about a new guy coming in and with so many experienced players out, you know, that your go-to players, you know, your uh, own bands, Ryan McHugh's, you know, Langans, uh, Kieran Thompson, 
you know, all these players out, just thinking, right, who's going to step up? Suddenly from nowhere, debuting Keelan McCoggan, man the match, had three unreal points. You know, uh, Conor O'Donnell, uh, again, had three brilliant points in the game too. One was left foot, was remarkable, and the carry defence more or less were like, you're out in your left, you know, we're going to wait for you to come inside, and he just curls the ball over the bar. And I think another player has to has to get a mention is, is uh, Daryl Boyle, who was completely out of favour in Declan Bonner's time. You know, Paddy made him captain against Down in the McKenna Cup, which was very interesting, and it just shows the new management comes in, you know, players can stand up. But, you know, going into that game, you know, we were doing a bit of commentary before it, and Oshin Kelly said to me, you know, can, can, you, can you predict it? And I said, it's, it's impossible to see. But what you did see in the game was Donegal respond to being, being, being almost out of the game in the first half. And they really rallied. And, and I suppose you're talking about Paddy Carr. That must be massively pleasing for him because already now he has that bit of a buzz in the group, you know, and training will be good this week leading into Tyrone. I know uh, Paddy, McBarty, uh, Paddy McBarty had a quiet game maybe coming up to that kick at the end. But how important is it for someone like him to stand up in a moment like that when a game is there to be won? And the new faces you were talking about, the likes of Caelan McCulgan and a few other guys, new like there weren't you know as many familiar faces as we would know or you know uh, that we'd know well from Dunny Gauls. So how important is it now in Michael Murphy's absence that guys almost stick their chest out and take the responsibility on? Well, yeah, and and Paddy's been been throwing back some lines about that. I've really been impressed with this because. I, I think in his interview pre the start of the league, people were saying that it's going to be a tough league, tough league. And he he's like, well, we, we want to excel, excel in the league. We want to go and beat everybody. And I actually loved his talk, you know, and he, he, he's he been asked a few questions about about taking on the captaincy and about the Donegal team as it stands. And there's no nonsense from him, you know, which is, which is really encouraging. And I, I suppose it's a great mental strength. He's our last tie back to the, to the great 2012 team uh, uh, playing corner forward that day. And I suppose... He's been there and seen it all now. And I suppose this irreplaceable stature figure that Michael Murphy was, you know, as a young lad is coming through, you say five David into the team and every one of them played their part at, 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 in the victory over Kerry. But if they're going to look to somebody to talk, who now is the most respected and senior man in there? It was, it has to be McBurdy. So, so it's massive for him. And then as I say, because... I think sometimes you can see that in the full forward line. You can be out of the game a bit. It, it quite often be a thing where you have to show maybe one a free, kick a free. But there was this doesn't carry their full, full back line from all Ireland on. So it was a difficult prospect inside, particularly uh, um, uh, for a full forward line. And Jimmy Brennan found it slow to get going for a while, but he really commanded it in the second half. But I say, what, what does it matter really when you kick the one in points? You know, that's all we remember. You, you talk about, it's funny how... In our game of GA, you know, you, you, there's point for points in there. There's some brilliant scores, but what really counts was McBerty's one. So as I say, it's it's great for him because I think that's one could be. There's many reasons that Michael Murphy stepped away, uh, Mick, but uh, I, I think that um, one of the big ones was probably that he set the tone and the tempo uh, all day, every day. And if he thought that maybe wasn't in his army anymore, it might have been just a thing that he he didn't want to be involved in. There's no doubt he could have played. So for Patrick. To, to kind of nail two points on the board it's great for him in terms of I suppose his leadership now as well going forward On McBearty's performance it's funny you, you are only one ball away from playing well particularly if it's at the end of a game you're only one you know one positive thing with the ball away from, from winning a game and just Anthony Moyes was talking earlier on the week on, on OTBAM about Patrick McBearty's you know change of role shall we say like probably a lifelong corner forward, particularly at county level, and maybe adapting to have to play that full forward role. Would you have even seen that much in your own career? They are two different positions. I know sometimes teams might only have one inside or they might only have two inside, but there's a massive difference, say, from McBearty's point of view, playing at the edge of the square or predominantly at the edge of the square, maybe compared to being out in the corner where you're maybe only going to get one in three balls, whereas if you're in around the edge of the square, you know, you should be getting the bulk of the balls are going to come down the middle. Would you have had anything like that in your own career? And it's probably going to take a few games for Patrick to settle into as well. Yeah, well, I, I think yeah, you're right. Um, there are two different roles. If you go back to when there was a time that used to be, I mean, when he first came on the scene, um, you know, you, it, it was always two inside, uh, probably just coming to the end of that time. And he would have been probably the player came out a bit much, and then Michael would have rotated and that. But my, Patrick was just an undoubted star. You remember he played for minor and senior in, in the one day uh, in Jim's first year, which is an amazing thing to do. You think of the athletic ability of the boy at that stage. And uh, we were just like, wow, here comes another huge talent on the back of having Murphy in there and Carl McFadden. But I think for him at club and at underage level and 
everywhere he went, uh, schools, college, whatever, he was the main man inside. And I think it took him a while to adjust to the fact that he was, you know, certainly third in the list compared to McFadden and uh, Murphy and McFadden kicking freeze as well, which meant it took, I suppose, Patrick a while to kind of be the main man. And I think once he did, he was always a central player and that's where he'd, where he'd be for his club. And I think he rebels in that. And it's interesting you make that point because him and um, Murphy could never play well together. Um, for whatever reason, um, I, I, I and I just think it's I think Patrick just likes to be right. I'm the full forward. I'm the go-to guy. I kick the freeze, uh, particularly the left footed ones. He loves that responsibility. He rebels in it, so I think it suits him um, to to be in that position. Just the word, Brendan, on Jack O'Connor uh, wasn't particularly happy after the game. He just made a point that Donegal had a point there that was blatantly wide. I mean, everyone understand. You saw that, did you? Um, I would have said there was a definitely a very debatable Kerry point at one stage yes. as well. But yes. if if you're if you're a Kerry uh, player or a Kerry supporter, surely you're you're happy that Jack is fighting tooth and nail at this stage for a point in the league. You know, it's kind of a a statement of intent. He probably knows. Uh, how difficult it's going to be to pick up points in this league. It, it is a. It's probably not a bad thing. Like if he was just letting it rub off his shoulder and it wasn't a big deal, there'd be maybe a sense that some complacency would set in. But he was. Uh, it was that was definitely stuck in his craw after. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Listen, he's a winner. Um, Command the season so so well last year, as you said. You know, not not coughing up any games except for that last one, and I think only conceding that one goal uh, throughout that that whole run and. and it was something, I suppose, that, you know, you probably seen uh, that narkiness was more probably that he, he knew that Kerry had enough to at least get a point. And he'd be happy to go down the road going, we got a point. And listen, he's a coach. You look at the stars, we all know, obviously, the Rathmore, and the, the Fossil boys and that gone, and, and, you know, Sean O'Shea and, and boys like that. Of course, listen, when you have all those players, do you say then that, that uh, it's an easier job? So I think in many ways, maybe he looked at that going, you know, I'm threadbare here. I'm going to put together a tactic, tactical team. I'm going to bring on my subs at the right time, which I think he did. And I'm going to do enough to win this match. And I think maybe maybe it was a wee money challenge for him after maybe the success that they swept uh, last year. So I think that's what it was. You know, if, you, if you're if you someone that's complaining about a, a potential wide point in the game that gets you, it's irrelevant because unless it's the last kick of the game or that you can never call into question what was what. And as you said there, it was definitely wide because that was the opposite side to where he was on this near post on our side where, where we were doing the commentary from. So so listen, that was a definite wide as well. But but I, I think what more I'd say his frustration was that in that period when, when Kerry were chasing down the one point lead at Donegal's with time closing in, they missed three simple opportunities. And I was think that's probably more where his frustration was coming out. Can I just ask you, Brendan, as a forward, I wonder what your perspective is as the the roving keeper, it looks like it's here to stay, but there was definitely, you know, Rory Began was probably caught out in the Monaghan game. Uh, Brendan McCall was dispossessed in the Donegal game. Carlo got a, a goal against Wicklow in Division 4 as well. Where do you stand even as a forward on that? Is the risk worth the reward? And as, as a forward, would you love to be facing that, trying to get play a game of chicken with a keeper, try and show him a pocket of space and then cut down the space? I would love to be like those that Monaghan and, and, and uh, Kerry goes kicking the ball into the empty net. That's not a, <laughs> that's not a bad scenario. Uh, listen, listen. from a Donegal perspective, obviously signaling because something similar happened there, of course, at the end of the championship last year, the same two players. And uh, I suppose just another word, listen, on Pat, and I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, these kickouts are absolutely phenomenal. Of course, if the short kickouts are on, people want to take it and work it. And particularly as Donegal were feeling their game, the way into the game at that stage. But I mean, of all things, again, go back to poor Paddy Carey, he must be thinking, well, Lord God, what is going on here? I mean, a giveaway bloody goal when, when Donegal were, were, were already chasing the game a small bit in the first half. But listen, they responded well, but this roving keeper... I, um, I don't know, it's strange, all the keepers out there were like, they said, we want to be out and part of the game and come out doing this and that and they're more involved. And, you know, maybe that's great from one perspective, but it just upsets the flow of the game. Listen, I was at a Seagerson game the other night and the keeper was coming out, it was uh, Jordanstown against uh, UCD and the keeper coming out for all the kickouts and that. And it just seems to unbalance things a bit. I, I don't know, I, I can't say that I like it, you know. Um, but listen, I just think from Began's perspective and, and Pat and that, they're so good that if, if no, I'm not blaming Patton for the goal as such. McCool had the ball in one hand, he should have held on to it tighter. It was a wet day and blah blah blah. First game, but 
I just looking at some of Patton's kickouts, they were almost within a couple of inches of, of a carry man getting a hand on it and straight under Donegal boy's chest. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's unreal. You would think sometimes it was he lucky, but he does it that often that he's just that good. But certainly like for, for Vinnie Corey as well and, and a start at Monaghan, you know, that that was probably the deciding the thing that gave Armagh the, the push to win the game. So that's very disappointing from him and his first home game as well. So listen, I suppose Mon- Monaghan and Donegal fans w- would be happy for, for the keeper to try and clip the ball out the wing or go long and, and gain possession from that because at least you have a chance to defend it then. Just lastly, from a Donegal point of view going forward, Brendan, can they kick on from this? I'm sure you're hoping that they're going to be able to kick on and you know get the at least the five or six points that are needed to stay up in Division 1 and potentially push on. But there, I'd be a bit fearful that that could be a slight false dawn but, because you're going to need to back it up week after week after week now. Yeah, listen, realistically, you know, it's still a, a squad that's very threadbare. Look at the throne team the last day. They had a good side out. I mean, they're three points up and they got that goal. Darren McCurry slips in. If they go six points up, listen, the Bayern there is going to win that game. And now all the abuse, and I was just thinking about the management, you know, the different people that just from game one, whatever it is about game one, it seems to almost like people are like, that's us for the season. I was in the room on the Monday uh, yesterday and people were saying, oh, there might need to be a change. I was like, here, lads, come on, come on. You go and beat us next week and, you know, everything's back to some level of normality. So, listen, that's a very difficult game. That's a hardened uh, top throwing team. As I say, all Ireland championship a couple of years ago, they have the majority of that team out. We don't have the majority of our team. So a massive, massive test for the lads. Maybe in some ways, you know, if they're targeting their three home games, if they won them, think six points will stay up. That could be the thing. You know, you have Tyrone, Donegal, Monaghan away after that. They're back-to-back away games. So if they could get a one out of either of them, it would set them in fantastic uh, uh, a state for it to go. And I think just how teams are playing now, everyone's playing a bit of a blanket defence. It does allow teams to play a bit and allows teams to grow into the game because everybody gets a touch of the ball. You know, you're on with them... Just talking about them five debutants and that, you know, used to be years ago you you were debutant. Sometimes you're one on one and it could go against you or, or the game could pass you by or the pressure's on. Whereas now everybody gets a wee touch of the ball and gets under the game. And I think that'll suit this Donegal team as they as they kind of mould themselves under the force. And as these players come back, uh, I think Donegal will get better and better. So if they were to pick up a, a one against their friends in Tyrone uh, uh, on Sunday would, would be massive and would it set them up for the rest of the league It'll be spicy no doubt much like your curry so you go and let that curry digest <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll chat again thanks a million Brennan Cheers Mike no more man just fly through the other Division 1 results really really quickly uh, so last weekend also saw victories for Roscommon a great win for Davy Burkside 3-11 to Tyrone's 1-12 Armagh had a 2 point victory over Monaghan 1-14 to 1-12 and Mayo and Galway drew an epic uh, up in McHale Park on Saturday evening uh, Gaelic football coverage on Off the Ball is in partnership with AIB proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships check out hashtag the toughest for more we will have former Psycho star Neil Ewing and after the break. Off the ball on News Talk. Now we're continuing our look back, uh, look back at the National Football League, the opening round weekend. Delighted to be joined by fly, former Sligo star Neil Ewing. How are you, Neil? Hey, Michael. How's things? How's the form? Good, good, good. Uh, were you as happy as everybody else to have the the leagues back? There seems to be, uh, with the split season now, it just seems like the six month gap between you know, the end of last year's championship and the start of next year's league, grounds around the country just seem to be buzzing from, you know, from looking over at all the different games all over the weekend. You know, pretty full stadiums, fans just absolutely mad for, mad for action. Yeah, definitely. I think um, there's nothing like the closed season to give kind of every county a little bit of hope. And I think when you when you extend that season, closed season a little bit longer, uh, it only increases the hope in all the counties. Now, the only thing I will say, as a player, uh, you know, I, I loved playing, you know, probably the harder ground, uh, the the brighter days. Uh, so, you know, starting the league in January isn't ideal from that perspective. You're probably at the mercy of poorer weather conditions. But definitely from a supporter's perspective, I think we just, yeah, we we really want want action back after the long inter-county break. You're stepped away a while now, Neil, but like when you, you have these big games coming back around this time of the year, do you feel that kind of itch of, you know, knowing that these big games are around the corner, these are the games that you did all the hard slogging for to showcase your talents on a, a Saturday afternoon or evening or a Sunday afternoon? 
Ah, uh, definitely, yeah. And I think, you know, even, you know, we spoke about that from a supporter's point of view, but there is something special even from a player's point of view, the first National League game. You know, there's a few kind of milestones in, in, in the season that, that um, yeah, definitely uh, tr- trigger that little bit of uh, nostalgia for uh, which, you know, you kind of remember uh, the good points about it. But definitely, you know, after a long preseason, um, even, you know, as the week went on last week, you'd nearly be putting yourself in the shoes of the lads. You know, you know, what would you be doing on the Monday of, uh, of the, of the week of the first league game? The Tuesday night, you know, you're probably used to the last three Tuesday nights or the first three Tuesday nights in January. Heavy slogging. You're going into that, uh, last Tuesday night before the league, knowing things are going to be a bit lighter. Is there going to be a team named on the Tuesday night? Is the team going to be named Friday night? Again, you know, the Friday night, probably just a Sharpman up session. You know, you're, you're really, you're hopping off the ground and you're, you're probably putting yourself in, in the shoes of the lads all week when, when you're just after stepping away, really. Yeah. Do you, do you, sounds like you miss it somewhat as well. Like it's one thing being a pundit and that, but, uh, do you still long somewhat for your playing days or are you happy with your lot? Ah, uh, yeah. As I said, there, it, there's a bit of nostalgia and rose tinted glasses there. Like it's, uh, it's, it's the little Friday night Sharpman up session that you might miss. But, uh, yeah, on a Tuesday night when you might have been, uh, jumping in a car in Sligo and heading down to that lawn or Longford, uh, to, to meet the lads in Dublin and uh, play through a session. Uh, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't miss that now. Maybe, uh, clearing a bit of ice off the windscreen when you hop back into the car. No, no. So it's, um, yeah. Uh, on balance, I think uh, if you if you go hard for a while, lad, it's give it your all. It, it's a bit easier to step away then. Disappointing start uh, for your own county in Division Four. Uh, Nian finished Sligo eleven points, Leash two eleven. I would say a big win for Leash. To be fair, um, because last last season was probably a really really disappointing season. Um, a good win for Leash, but disappointing for your own lads on home soil in particular. Uh, yeah, it's just a huge win for Leash. You know, it, they were just in a funny kind of place last year. You know, even some of their league games, you know, I remember like, you know, following Division 3 as the season went on last year. You know, uh, it's like everything, every every league, every season, there's there's a sliding doors moment, you know, there's a game or two that your whole season can kind of swing on. And Leash just seemed to lose a bit of momentum coming towards the end of the season. Then went into Talton Cup and probably underperformed versus their expectations in that. But at the same time, you know, you see them coming down and while they mightn't have, you know, the same reputation as maybe a Cavan had who were in Division 4 last year, I still fancy them to probably be the strongest team uh, team in the division. You know, for them to come up to Sligo, who, you know, would be perceived as one of the rivals for promotion and go back down the road with, with two points is a huge win for them. You know, Billy Sheehan um, lost. You know, Colin Begley, Ross Monley, John Lockin over the winter. You know, that's a lot of experience gone from the dressing room. If you start a Division 4 season in a county that doesn't expect to be there, you know, even just the, the outside noise can kind of start to see, seep into lads' heads. And a, a young squad like that with a few leaders could lose momentum. So for him to have two points on the board uh, heading into this weekend is huge. And even just to arrest that slide, you know, you can imagine them, you know, they're bouncing back into training on Tuesday. Um, whereas you know, if if they had uh, if they come away with zero points, it's a different story. Uh, go, going into training and choose the night, and yeah, Sligo on the other hand, it was funny. I think you know there was a lot of I, I'm reluctant to say expectation in Sligo last week, but uh, there was a lot of um, you know hopes were high heading into the season, and you know I think probably even among the Sligo fan base, the Leash were underestimated a little bit. And then, you know, Sunday morning, you know, we were even talking, I mentioned there, weather conditions, you woke up and, you know, it, it seemed like it was a, a decent day, you know, probably as good a day as you're going to get for a game of football in January. But just coming up to throwing time, conditions changed and, you know, it's not to make excuses for the, for the lads at all. You know, they'll be disappointed with some of the very simple mistakes or made some of the turnovers. But the weather did change. It turned into a heavy, wet sort of a day. The wind really picked up. And one thing Sligo probably lack, and it's no fault of the guys that are there. And it's, yeah, maybe it's a it's a gene pool issue in Sligo or how we're breeding them. But we don't have, you know, naturally big men. You know, you can put lads into a gym for three or four years on a strength and conditioning program. But, you know, we probably don't have lads with, with the skeleton to put that, you know, bulk on that, that really stands to you during winter football. Probably takes away from our ability to win primary possession. That, you know, that can mean maybe, you know, attacks are slower. You know, if you're playing against a team with a well-organized defense, they become very hard to break down. 
Then on the other hand, you know, if they're winning primary possession, you know, Sligo are trying to play a relatively attacking brand of football. You know, even supporters mightn't think that sometimes to look at it. But if you're if you're not winning that primary possession, the opposition are, and you're trying to push right up, you can leave yourself a little bit open at the back. And I think that's ultimately what won the game for Leash. And what Sligo will be really disappointed with is the concession of the two goals. An opening round defeat kind of puts Sligo on the back foot somewhat now. Definitely. And uh, yeah, even even talking to some lads about it last week, you know, it was, you know, leash at home this weekend. If we can get a good performance, you know, get maybe two points on the board, heading into that Wicklow game away doesn't seem, you know, overly daunting. Not not that it's not that it's not a, a difficult trip. But, you know, you lose to leash a disappointing performance, then, you know, the myth of Ockram grows and it's all Ockram very tough place to go to and uh, you know, it's a cliche, but you know, it can start to seep into lads' heads that it's maybe a, a difficult place to go rather than just a game to be won. So, you know, I think you know Tony McEntee and the managing team will be uh, putting a lot of focus on this, week, kind of blocking out that noise, getting the lads back, kind of task focused, uh, going back over just some of those basics. You know, shutting up shop at the back. But yeah, it is. It's definitely a difficult assignment, and you know, quite unique this weekend. Um, we'll have uh, two. Uh, Club All Ireland winners of Cross and Glen and also our Ma in, in opposition camps on, on the side. And you'll have Oshie McConville up against Tony McEntee. So I know myself when I was watching that great Arma team uh, back in the early 90s, I never imagined that I'd, uh, I'd see a Sligo, Sligo versus Wicklow, Wicklow National League game managed by, by two guys on the pitch. It's funny you should say that actually because this weekend in the Division 1 National Hurling League as well, uh, Leash come up against Tipperary and Willie Maher, the Leash manager, is from Ballingarry and Liam Cahill, the Tipperary manager, is also from Ballingarry. So there's a couple of two games this weekend where club mates are Whoa, facing yeah. off on the sideline, which is hasn't happened too often. Yeah. I think Desi Farrell and Kieran McGinney are both for Nafina. They faced off against each other. Michael Fenley and Henry Shefflin uh, with Galway and Offaly. They're both Bally Hale, obviously. And it's happened a couple of times with J- Jimmy Barry Murphy and John Allen and then with Jimmy Barry Murphy against Gerald McCarthy. I'm actually doing a piece for the paper at the weekend about this. So it's funny that you're, you're after adding another one to the list in the two, the two cross McGlenn. Glenn fellas um, but it's definitely well yeah I, I thought it was extremely unique but uh, yeah obviously not no it's, uh, it's, it's been repeated all over the place so to see ah, it's, it's, um, it's still it's still unique enough now it's still it's still unique enough it doesn't happen every day of the, the week the, anyway the geography of that one's probably interesting as well the, the leash and temporary game probably isn't taking place too far away from Ocker Mitre like but um, yeah I think even the the Usher McConnell Tony McIntyre one is quite unique in terms of um the location of the two counties, you know, uh, versus Armagh as well. Like it's, it's, uh, uh, they're not like they're in close proximity to to uh, to their home club in Crossland Lane. So, yeah, I'm sure uh, there'll be uh, there'll be a few interested heads from Crossland Lane. will probably make the journey down to Ockram just again too. Without a doubt, uh, another high profile manager in Division Four. It's great to see such high profile even on the sideline in Division Four. When you look at, let's say, Oshie McConville on the Wicklow sideline and Andy Moore, and obviously the former Mayo star in Leitrim. They've hit the ground running again. Uh, they would have been expected probably to, to get over Waterford, but did it with the minimum of, of fuss. They made quite a bit of progress last year. I know they would have been disappointed with uh, with how they went out at the Halton Cup. So kind of narrowly, the margins are so fine, obviously. Uh, but he's hit the ground running again with Leitrim by the looks of things. Yeah, and you know, from from a Sligo perspective, there just seems to be you know a worrying bit of momentum and enthusiasm around the, the Longford or the Leitrim team. Since Andy Morans went in, but you know, even this year, they just quietly seem to be progressing. Seems to be a decent bit of buy-in from the players in the county, which maybe hadn't always been the case. Um, so you know, as a team that will possibly, like, will be hoping will to to look at promotion, as would Leitrim. Uh, you know, you'd prefer to see them uh, not with that bit of momentum and enthusiasm. But that said. You know, they're a county, you know, that I, to be honest, I'd actually hugely admire them. You know, very small population, but, uh, you know, the interest in football uh, in Leitrim is, is absolutely huge and, and probably understated across the country. You know, uh, people probably write them off, but, you know, per capita, um, even their attendances uh, are, are probably rack up against some of the bigger counties, uh, especially, you know, when you look at the like city attendances, maybe, you, you know, footballers in Cork get stuff like that. Maybe that's an extreme example, but, um, yeah, definitely. I think um, Andy Moran has brought a bit of buy, uh, a bit of buy in there. But 
again a strong backroom team as well. You know, he has Mike Solon there who uh, is uh, is involved in his management team who was in the running for the Mayo job. Lost James Glancy, the former Leitrim player, to uh, the Longford backroom team this year. Um, James Glancy would have worked with Paddy Christie in, in Ballymont uh, when he was a games promotion officer up there. But like that, you know, Andy has went out and he's recruited uh, well even to, to fill that backroom team. He's taken in Luke, who was involved with uh, Anthony Cunningham in Roscommon last year. So, you know, he's obviously done his homework on Luke as well. He, he'd come with a decent reputation. But, you know, I think the big thing there as well is it's a young, uh, it's another young face added to that management team. And, uh, you know, just a lot of the changes in the game and, you know, trying to get young lads at the minute bought, bought into uh, an intercounty system. You know, if you have uh, young faces, fresh voices, uh, that, that's a huge thing. And, yeah, they, they had a pretty comprehensive win over Waterford. Then I suppose, you know, that comes with, uh, you know, a question mark. Waterford came out the wrong side of a few narrow defeats last year, but their form wasn't great. They've always struggled with availability of players, especially when you, you know, you look at how strong the the, the pull of hurling is in the county. So you don't exactly know who or what was available to F.E. Fitzgerald at the minute or how far that is off the best they can offer. So uh, Leitrim will be heading to London this week. You know, I'd say Andy Moran was delighted with the win last weekend. It'll be maybe scratching his head a little on what what exactly he's learned about the players that took the field. You know, sometimes if you get a little bit of a test or a fright, it can actually help you. But they come forewarned with this London team. I think they played them, was it the second or maybe the third um, league game last year? And London uh, defeated them. Again, it was actually played in the centre of excellence, Valley Hornets, during... It was definitely an orange weather warning. Um, you know, probably a game that maybe shouldn't have went ahead. London pipped them in that one and ultimately it kept Leitrim out of the race for promotion at the end. Can I just ask you a quick one? There's an interesting one in Division 4. So one of London, Leitrim or Sligo are potentially New York, but they're obviously not in Division 4. So one of those three or four, if you include New York, is guaranteed a place in the Connacht final and by extension the Sam Maguire. Uh, which of those four, or we'll even go which of the three in particular, looking at Lon- London, Leitrim or Sligo, is best placed to take that Connacht final place and the carrot of, you know, competing at Sam Maguire that potentially goes with it? Yeah, uh, it's a funny one. You're, you're maybe the inclination to discount uh, New York, but uh, I know from uh, talking to a few friends over there when, when the draw was made last October and they were on the same side as the other three, uh, there was a few WhatsApp groups in New York buzzing with, with excitement and, and the thought of a Connacht final. So, um, yeah, we might we might be writing them off too quickly. I that would that would definitely to... create lots of logistical problems for the GAA anyway, uh, without a doubt. Because yeah. I don't think they've never had to, you know, they've never had to cater for that a second game. It's always only been the first game. So that would definitely be an interesting one if it did happen. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, we, we we've seen in the last two weeks the GAA are, are good at the problem solving skills, <laughs> so, so that, that that won't be an issue for them. But uh, yeah, no, I I guess there's probably a better even story there in terms of the New York team as well. You know the fact that they were able to come home last year and play, um, you know, play a game in Ireland, and even you know the progress in terms of the undocumented over there. You know that that's not an issue for them anymore. It probably even points to the demographic of Irish lads going over there. So you know, there's definitely a positive story there, and also in the amount of homegrown players that they seem to be developing as well. So you know, they definitely deserve kudos for that. And um, looking at, I suppose, the other three uh, that are that are in Division Four. Um, you know, it, it's very hard to say. Um, London, um, again, kind of similar to uh, some of the work New York has done in the home base. London are starting to develop a strong core. You know, they have Michael Maher in there as manager. Um, you know, he really he, he has something about him. He seems to have retained, did I see, 20 of uh, last year's 29-man squad, which, again, obviously for, you know, uh, uh, a county, one of the, I suppose, the exile counties, it's going to be difficult to, to reduce that squad turnover, but they definitely seem to be, um, you know, producing a few of their own lads who are, who have, uh, you know, strong roots in London. So, um, and they've also added Endel in from Derry this year and Kevin McCarthy, who would have, you know, played a bit of National League, uh, with Curry as well. So, you know, they, they've got a few additions like that, which also adds a sense of surprise that, you know, a Sligo or a Leach are never going to have, you know, probably Division 1 footballers joining them over the winter months. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where London go in the next few weeks. Then, you know, uh, Sligo and Leitrim in terms of going into the race for Sam Maguire, a lot probably depends on how their league campaigns finish up. And 
you know, no, no matter what we say, whoever ends up in that kind of final is going to have had a win, you know, in the Minnacana kind of Championship as well. And it's it's amazing what, what a kind of championship can win. And then, you know, you're kind of looking at the draw you're going to get in that round robin. You're probably going to end up, you know, with one provincial winner. I think is the draw set that it could be the, the Munster Championship winners will be in that group with the Connors runners up. So then, you know, if you could get a slightly favourable draw in Division Two, you know, I think any any of those three teams would like a rattle at uh, at a, a two maybe Division Two team uh, in a group stage of a Sam Maguire, and then you know maybe you get the right the right team at home. You, can, you know, you can maybe try and get a victory, and you know then you're heading into next season. You know, you're possibly looking at a team who has got promotion from Division Four, who has got to a Connacht final, and who has won a game in the Sam Maguire. So you know, you, you know, you've had a great season there. Um, um, for a Division Four team, and there's real tangible progress. So, uh, you know, I'm going to say it, it'd be great for Sligo uh, to get to get to that kind of final. You know, it'd be great to see uh, David Clifford, Buddy Clifford uh, in action in Markovic Park. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll hang my hat on that one. I was thinking the hat would the black and white hat would remain all right. Uh, Neil, thanks a million for joining yeah. us. We've uh, another busy weekend of action coming up this weekend, and we'll talk soon, no doubt. Thanks a million. Pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much. Take care. Enjoy. So Gaelic football coverage on Off the Ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling uh, Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. After the break, we will have Mead legend Nigel Crawford on Colm O'Rourke's first, win, uh, first league win as Mead boss. Off the Ball on News Talk. Uh, our attention switches back to football again. Delighted to say we're joined by Mead legend Nigel Crawford. Nigel, how are you? Hey, Michael, you well? Good. Um, I'd imagine you were very happy with the opening weekend. I was at a couple of the O'Burn Cup games that Mead played. I have to be honest, didn't didn't blow me away exactly. But it's amazing going down to Cork for on the on that opening weekend. It makes such a difference to get a result. Here. There's a spring in your step almost going into round two. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Super start. Um, best thing for that new management team. Really just can't emphasise how important that is. But what I would say is I don't think they'll be getting too carried away with it. Um, I was just reading there the Cork's record in the first round of the league over the last, I think, seven years. They've only won it one, once, the opening game, and that was when they were in Division Three. So, you know, they're, they're slow starters. Um, but for me, super, super result. Really happy with it. Um, and it's given the county a lift. I think there's huge optimism there now at the moment. Has even Colm O'Rourke's appointment, Nigel, did that give things a, a bit of a lift as well? Just such a marquee name, uh, obviously as a player, then as a pundit. And I think the fact that he would take a punt at this stage and put his neck on the block, I think was a big statement too. Yeah, yeah. He's been telling us all how to do it for the last <laughs> 30 years. So it'll be nice to see him now on the other side and we can criticise him. But uh, no, I, I know Colm well. I was surprised with the appointment. I don't think anyone saw it coming. Um, but yeah, great appointment. I think um, he deserves a chance. I think it's good to see him in the role. Um, so I think, yeah, people were happy to see that. Again, it was a surprise. I think um, there were other names expected to be appointed and he kind of came out of left field. He said that was the third time he's put his name forward for him. I'm not sure I believe him on that. I think there was other times in the past where Mead looked for him and uh, he maybe wasn't available. So I don't know if I believe him on that. But I think, yeah, with, with his experience, with the name he has, I think it's the right appointment for me. I think it gives them a lift. Um, I think bringing Sean Boylan in is a great move as well, having Sean as part of his team and just the connection there to... Um, past glories with Sean and, and the skills and qualities that Sean brings to a setup. I don't think that's specific to a particular era or a team. Like Sean is so great with um, people and, and knowing people and seeing things in people. And I think it was a great move from Colm doing that. And some of the other selectors he has in with him, like I played many years with Stephen Bray, played with Barry Callahan as well. Like Barry was a super smart footballer, um, really knowledgeable. Um, and Stephen was one of the best forwards me have ever produced. So, and again, a, a recent player, someone that the current players can uh, really relate to. So I think Colm has put together a really good team. Then he brought in two additions from the Mead ladies team who had such huge success again. You know that's going to bring a winning culture to that setup. I think we started to see some of that influence as well with him, and then um, Shane Supple and goals. You know, I think 
you know, you said you weren't too excited about Mead in the uh, O'Byrne Cup, but I think, you know, didn't concede goals, not conceding big scores, albeit they conceded plenty of points the last day, but starting to see some positive signs there, which is great. It just, I actually went down and studied column for the second half of the O'Byrne Cup game against Leash because it's one thing looking in the stand. I was just wanted to hear what message he was giving him, and they were kind of going laterally across the field at one stage inside the sixty-five, and he just kept shouting, "Go forward, go forward!" Mm. Trying to play. Does it look like that to you that they're trying to play positive football? Yeah, and I'm delighted to see that, and I think Mead people generally be really delighted to see that. When you look back at Mead's success under Sean Boylan and other managers, it was playing direct positive football like that. It's, it's I think, in the DNA for Mead and how they play. So not a surprise that Colm is bringing that, but I think it's great for the game as well. And for too many years now, we've been looking at teams hand-passing backwards and kicking balls back to goalkeepers. People don't want to see that, and, you know... It, to me, it's not something I particularly want to play. Um, so maybe it's going to be a bit chancy. Maybe it's going to, you know, leave us open to potentially conceding scores at the other end. You know, big points were scored against me the last day. But I'd much prefer that. I'd prefer that than, you know, going into this dour shootout where we're afraid to kick the ball forward and afraid to put it in for a man to try and win it. Um, I know that's maybe a bit of a throwback, but for me, that's the way the game should be played. And I think it can be played successfully as well. I don't think you have to play that safe game to win. When you have forwards of the calibre of like Killian O'Sullivan, Jordan Morris, Shane Walsh as well, you do want to get the ball into them as quick as possible. Get them on the ball. They're, you know, they're able to do things. They're able to, able to make a magic up front as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you look at successful me teams, they got goals. And why? Because they gave balls in early and long and it creates those mismatches. It gets gets your forwards one-on-one or better chances. Um, so I think it's the right tactic to play for me. Um, certainly delighted to see that. And then, you know, you put it on the shoulders of these forwards and let them take on their men. Now, again, bit of caution here, first round of the league against maybe not a brilliant core team or a core team that hasn't been prepared or is up to speed quite yet. But I do think, you know, they're going to face tougher challenges, more organised teams like Clare and obviously Dublin are in their league and Derry, you know, teams like that who have strong systems there who will be prepared for that. But I do hope me persist with this and really go for it. There's a nice, the, the idea of playing Dublin in Division 2, there is something kind of special and unique about it and exciting about it, I'd imagine, from a Mead point of view, because they've had the strong arm, arm on you for long enough. It would be nice to, I suppose, kick back a bit of realistic resistance, shall we say. Yeah, yeah, and I think a league game is a good place to start that. Um, it's probably a long time since the two teams have faced off in the league and realistically in the championship over the last, probably... 13 years now, Mead haven't really been that competitive at all with Dublin and nearly there was a feeling going into these games it was damage limitation and never should that have been the way in Mead-Dublin games and, you know, I think in a league game like this it's probably a free shot that Mead can have a real cut at them and really go after them and see how that gets on and bring that confidence then maybe into a championship, a Leinster championship game against Dublin. So it'd be exciting. I'm not sure if it's home or away, but it'd be exciting seeing that. Um, I'd be great if it was in Navin, seeing that, a full crowd there for that. Can I just ask you about Donald Keoghan as well, Nigel? Like, I don't know if the wider GA repu- uh, public realises just how good he is. Like, he's an absolute gem of a player. He's captain this year. He's been around for well over a decade now at this stage. Like, And he's performed unbelievably well in maybe teams that haven't been up to the level of previous teams. But just give me a bit of background on him. Like, he's a, he's a un- unique fella off the field as well, by all accounts. Yeah, I don't want to embarrass him now and, and age him, but I actually played with Donald. Donald was in as kind of um, a development player when I was finishing up, so that shows how long he's been around. But a super player, really, really great servant. Um, I think it was Colm maybe who actually said it himself that you know he would have been a really strong player and got into any me team, and I think that's true. Um, a real gent, a good guy. Um, but a hard, tough player in the mould of old Mead defenders as well, where he just gets on with it, hits hard, but plays fair. Well, maybe some people would say we weren't always fair or defenders, but um, I, he, he was a fair, tough, he's a fair, tough player and plays that Mead style of um, strong defence. And he, uh, he's a really, really good 
um, leader and I think you need that you need a couple of leaders there and Colm needs that in his team that few fellas like that who can bring on some of the younger players and he's also a throwback to when Mead actually did beat Dublin and you know a period when he played with players who would have um, experienced that so he can be that link and bring that team forward and a really important player for me going forward What do you think is a realistic goal or aspiration for Mead under Colm? Like he kind of has stated that you know, putting it up to the dubs and ultimately beating the dubs is like you can't really aim for anything else and you have to try and stop their Leinster dominance. What do you think is realistic? Um it's a hard one. Like I'm I'm after coming from Ballyboden under ten football training this evening and there's over a hundred boys under 10 boys playing in that and that's replicated in clubs all around Dublin. So they're up against a machine and mead won't be able to compete with that in pure numbers. So what they need is they need a crop of players coming together and someone like Colm and Sean and the management team, they're really bringing them together. Like, I don't know if they can sustain that over a long period of time, but certainly at the start, they need to bring that. And I think in the first year, there's a really good opportunity. I think if they could, you know, get a couple of wins in Division 2, you know, establish themselves well there and push uh, for promotion. That'd be a great start. But bringing it into the championship, I think we need to get back to not this damage limitation against Dublin, about really going out and having a go. Look, if that's not good enough and they get beaten, so be it. But I really want to see me teams have a go. And I think the me public wouldn't have a problem with a me team going out against Dublin and losing as long as they had a real go at them and put it up to them physically and in football terms. I think in the past it felt like we were defeated going into the game. Um, I don't mean that as a slight on any players. I think that was just part of Dublin's dominance and aura. But I think if Colm can get that, that for me is success for him and where we really feel me are competing and he keeps the energy that's there now. Look, it's going to be down. They're going to have tough days. But... If he can keep this momentum going and keep people behind him, he'll have the full support of the county behind him, as will the team. And I think that will really um, give me football a lift, which is hugely important for uh, Leinster football and for the wider um, All-Ireland series as well. I have to ask you quickly before we go. I remember you telling me uh, for an article in the Sunday Independent in 2016 that the GA hung the players out to dry around the loud Mead fiasco in 2010. What have you made of how they've dealt with the current Glenn and Kilmacud Croke saga? Well, they haven't learned from their past mistakes, that's for sure. I think we're about eight days late with this judgment. It should have come out on Sunday evening or Monday morning. I don't know why it took over a week to do it. I think it's ridiculous. Again, it shouldn't have been brought back on Glenn and Kilma Cud to resolve this. I think we're facing an inevitable challenge. It's unfair and amateur players and um, clubs like that to be put through this. I think as a big organisation, I love I love football, I love hurling, but I think the GAA really let themselves down at times. And I think this is a perfect example of it. They should have come out straight away and made a decision. And I think both teams would have lived by it. I think now what's happened is dragged on for over a week. It's unfair. These are amateur players who are working, have other commitments, and now this has been put back on them. It's inevitably going to drag on. And I think it's the GAA, again, abdicating responsibility, not having a proper um, system for dealing with issues like this. You look at the amount of officials that were there on the day, again, between the officials, the body, everything like that, it came down to the club having to make an appeal Kilmacud then having to object and now we are about nine days later only getting a ruling on it so very disappointing I have to say and I feel for both clubs actually in this situation Nigel thanks a million for joining us really appreciate it we'll chat again soon thanks Michael all the best so Gaelic football coverage on Off the Ball is in partnership with AAB proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships check out hashtag the toughest for more